Ladies and gentlemen, the Railroad Hour. And from Hollywood, here comes the star-studded show train. Tonight, your railroads, through the Association of American Railroads, present the charming operetta, The Cat and the Fiddle. In our star-studded cast, you will hear the host of our series, Gordon McRae, two famous guest stars, Miss Reza Stevens and Mr. Adolph Manjou, and a great cast of Hollywood feature players. Our choir is under the direction of Norman Luboff, and the entire production is set to the music of Carmen Dragon's orchestra, and brought to you by the American Railroads, the same railroads that bring you most of the food you eat, the clothes you wear, the fuel you burn, and the things you use in your daily life. And now, here is Gordon McRae. Thank you and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Gordon McRae helping to bring you another in our series of musical comedy successes. Tonight, the Railroad Hour Show Train presents The Cat and the Fiddle, a musical love story by Jerome Kern and Otto Harbach. <laughs> As our first guest tonight, we are extremely happy to present one of the most charming ladies of the Metropolitan Opera, Miss Reza Stevens, whose lovely voice will be heard in one of the songs she is supposed to have written in her role as Shirley Sheridan, a young American composer. Try to forget who you, all you have meant to me, all I have meant to you too. My role this evening is that of Victor Florescu, also a composer. But my music is of the more serious type, as you will hear when I sing. One moment alone is all that we own, and yet in that instant rain. Also on our guest list is the popular Hollywood motion picture star, Mr. Adolf Manjou. Mr. Manjou plays a producer of musical shows who seems to prefer Shirley's music to mine when he says, That man should be put away, preferably behind bars, where I won't be able to wring his neck. Our story opens in Paris in the spring. It is dusk, and the setting sun is reflected in the river Seine, which flows by the cave Altair. Here, vendors are busy selling their flowers, their vegetables, their old books and maps. Along the street comes Pompano, a vendor of music selling songs of love. Many are the lovers whose lips have met as Pompano strolled by singing... La nuit est pour l'amour La nuit est pour l'amour Oh, bravo, monsieur. Votre chanson est très jolie. Oh, merci, mademoiselle. Voulez-vous acheter une coupée? Ah, mon monsieur, non pas aujourd'hui. Ah, mademoiselle is American, eh? Huh? <laughs> is my accent that bad? Oh, Pompino tells not only about the accent, mademoiselle. He tells about the look in the eye. The look in the eye? Certainement. Americans in Paris always have the look of hope that something will happen. Something? Oh, but yes, romance. And don't Frenchmen have a look of hope? Mademoiselle, Frenchmen do not hope. They know it will happen. Breathe the air, look around you. Romance is everywhere. And while you sit here on your bench waiting, I have the charming American song for you. Here, I sing it. She didn't say yes, she didn't say no, she didn't say stay, she didn't say go. She only knew the heat's fine of air, and then she knew he sat beside her there. Mademoiselle knows it. Mademoiselle wrote it. Mais no. Mais yes. Oh. See, right there, words and music by Shirley Sheridan. That's me. Incredible. Well, take the music away. I'll show you. She didn't say yes, she didn't say no, she didn't say stay, she didn't say go. She only knew that he had spied her there, and 
then she knew he sat beside her there. At first there was heard not one little word. Then coyly she took one sly little look, and something awoke and smiled inside. Her heart had started beating wild inside. So what did she do? I leave it to you. She did just what you do too. She didn't say yes. She didn't say no. She didn't say stay. She didn't say go. She only knew that he spied her there. And then she knew he sat beside her there. At first there was her, not one little word. And finally she took one sly little look. And something awoke and smiled inside. Her heart began beating wild inside. So what did she do? I leave it to you. She did just what you do to She didn't say yes. She didn't say no. Pardon, Mamselle, for my intrusion, but I just heard that song you sang. You have a fine talent for music. Thank you. Ah, uh, but what a pity you choose to cheapen it with such a vulgar commercial style. Well, really. Ah, uh, but your voice, the way you looked. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I know I'm a perfect stranger. Oh, but you're not. You're Victor Florescu, the prize student in composition at the conservatory. Oh, you study there, too? No, I had to stop. I guess you'd call it a lack of woman's tuition. <laughs> Was I not right, mademoiselle? In Paris in the spring, it always happens. And now, Pompino goes. La nuit est pour l'amour. La nuit est pour l'amour. Uh, but I did not go far. This was the first romance of the new spring season for Pompino, and it was still too young to trust without a guiding hand. I uh, leaned against a nearby street lamp to see if I could be a further help. I'm afraid our friend Pompano was a little too deep for me. What did he mean? It always happens. Oh, just something silly, Mr. Florescu. I, um, I'm glad I met you because I heard your symphony. It was very impressive. Impressive? Nothing more? Well, it was very sad and unhappy. You see, I tried to make it true to life, just as I'm trying in the new operetta I'm composing. But life isn't always sad. It can be thrilling and exciting and wonderful. Oh, it is when I look at you. Only twice before have I ever felt like this. The first time I heard Beethoven's Ninth, and then once in the Alps when I saw a sunrise, and now tonight, when I first saw you smile. <laughs> Mr. Florescu, back home, that would be called a line. You're afraid of life, aren't you? Oh, no, just cautious. For all I know, you may get a feeling like the sunrise over the Alps every afternoon, only with a different girl. Oh, you know that isn't true. Come have dinner with me. Oh, you seize opportunity quickly, don't you? It hasn't had a chance to knock even once as yet. Is that so bad? Oh, I suppose not. For a modern man. And aren't you a modern girl? I try to think I am. Then let me see you to your hotel. No. Hmm. That's not very modern. <laughs> I know. We'll have dinner at my house. Now you're getting futuristic. And even from 3,000 miles away, I can hear my Aunt Hester in Boston going... Very well, then. If you insist on propriety, I'll do the most proper thing I know. In place of a proper introduction, I'll write to you. I'll bombard you with letters until you say I may call. Could anything be more proper? Well, write to me if you wish. But you must send your letters to the American Express office. My, you are cautious. No, just practical. I can stay at my present address just two more weeks, then I must find new quarters. You can write me your address later when you answer my letters. You will answer, won't you? Perhaps. But if you lose interest, just stop writing. I'll understand. Lose interest? Oh, that would be like losing interest in life itself. In fact, I shall go now and write the first letter. Au revoir. Au revoir. Oh, I know what you're thinking, Aunt Hester. But you didn't see the look in his eyes. <laughs> ah, Pompey, no, you lovable romantic rascal. You've done it again. <laughs> However, the young man went away without learning the young lady's name. Luckily, Pompino knew that Monsieur Victor Florescu lived at La Petite Maison. So, leaving my lamp post quickly, I approached Miss Shirley and said, uh, <coughs> uh, Pardon, mademoiselle, you are looking for living quarters. How did you know? Oh, you just told Monsieur Victor. But that was just between him and me and the lamp post. I was the lamp post. Oh, 
Pompino, the greatest guide in all Paris, knows just the charming pension for you. La petite maison. Flowers, birds, sunshine, a place beloved by artists and musicians, and most reasonable. Oh, that sounds wonderful, but I can't move there for two weeks. So, Pompino arranges that homes be held for you. Here is the cart with the address on it. Oh, you're very kind. Oh, my pleasure, Mamsie. Oh, this has been such a wonderful day. Good night, and thank you, Pompino. Uh, bonsoir, Mamsie. Do not forget la petite maison. I will. Ah, now Bambino has truly brought the lovers together. In two short weeks, they will be living across the court from each other in La Petite Maison. Just as I was about to give myself a hearty pat on the back, I saw Monsieur Victor returning. I beg your pardon, mademoiselle, I... Oh, it's you. Uh, my apologies, monsieur. Uh, you have forgotten something, perhaps? Well, as a matter of fact, I have. I neglected to ask the young lady her name. Bambino can tell you that, monsieur. It is Sheridan, Miss Shirley Sheridan. Shirley. Oh, very lovely. It fits her. But the Sheridan part, I think she should consider as just temporary. I wonder if she has ever thought of changing it. Oh, monsieur, a girl does not think of changing her name every thousand miles as if it were motor oil. Perhaps. But I have a feeling I will change it for her one day. That is, if I ever see her again. Ah, uh, you shall never fear. Just leave everything to Pompino. Oh, Pompano, how can I thank you? You can buy a song from me, one I have written myself. <laughs> see, see. Composers in Paris must be a dime a dozen. Oh, sing it. I would rather watch the other fellow strolling down Lover's Lane. Watch him getting soft and mellow with love life on the brain. But how nice, cool as ice. With a sweet bonbon Just to dawdle and wisely smile While I look on Watch the love parade gaily going by Naughty man and willing maid Mischief in her eye See him squeeze her arm, press her little knee, buzzing round each rare fair charm like a busy bee. But when the march is ended and they part, when fears and tears are blended in each heart, I'm very glad I stayed sitting high and dry. Looking on the love parade, gaily going by. Why, Pompano, that's a very charming melody, but aren't the words a bit sardonic? That is my philosophy. Let the others fall in love while I sit back, foot loose and fancy free, watching the parade. With a love parade, gaily going by. Naughty man and willing make mischief in her eyes. I watch her closely cling to his manly side Thinking thoughts that well might bring blushes to a bride But when the march is ended and we part When tears and fears are blended in each heart I'm very glad I stayed sitting high and dry Looking on the love parade, gaily going by. Watch the love parade, gaily going by. We'll return to the cat and the fiddle in just a moment. But first, here is a bit of information that will interest you. No man is better known for results in the field of research than Charles F. Kettering of General Motors. Speaking of railroads and the research that goes into them, Mr. Kettering said, and I quote, No matter what other forms of transportation do or what new ones come into being, the railroads will remain the backbone of transportation. And he added... The amazing progress made by the railroads in their first century is only a promise of what they will do. End of quotation. 
The progress of which Mr. Kettering spoke is the product of research, carried on not only in the laboratory, but out of the great proving ground of the railroads themselves, plus the investment of billions of dollars in the better cars and engines, tracks and signals, and all the other improvements which research and invention have devised. And right now, to realize the promise of the future to which Mr. Kettering referred, the railroads are carrying forward an ever-increasing and expanding research program. And now back to the Cat and the Fiddle, starring Reza Stevens, Adolf Manjou, and yours truly, Gordon McRae. And here is Pompineau to continue our story. In two weeks, just as I had planned, Shirley and Victor were living across the court from each other at La Petite Maison. Before they had a chance to realize it, Victor had callers. Monsieur Jules Daudet, the great theatrical producer, and Odette, the famous prima donna. I uh, happened to be under Victor's window, just listening to the music, of course, as he played one of his new compositions. Ah, glorious Victor, n'est-ce pas, Jules? Well, frankly, Odette... Uh... Frankly what, Monsieur Daudet? I'm anxious to hear your smallest criticism. Oh, Victor, darling, please. I'll be happy to give you my criticism, Florescue. Very happy. Jules, be calm. Why should I be calm? I'm a producer. And in my meager experience of some 20 years in the theater, I have discovered that for some reason, audiences do not pay money to listen to funeral music. As I've told you before, I write only what I feel. Then feel better. You've uh, got to lighten that score with some brighter numbers. The score stands exactly as I have Victor, planned. Victor, darling, Jules, this can all be worked out, and we'll have a wonderful show. Victor, chérie, go back to the piano and play that number you wrote for me in the third act, eh? I'll play, too, on my fiddle. Very well. Ah, oh, Jules, Jules, listen to me. Victor will do better, I'm sure. Oh, he's just in a mood. Two weeks ago, he met some little American girl. And instead of working, he began writing long letters to her. So, when she finally answered one, I simply destroyed it before he saw it. Soon he will forget all about her. <laughs> you know, composer. Yes, too many of them. Sing the words, Victor, darling, while I play. Very well. The breeze kissed your hair, knowing you were fair, and all the night seemed to, I wanted to, but I did not dare. sat with you, then vanished from your view. One moment alone, that's all we have known, and yet it seemed paradise. We own, 
And yet in that instant rain, life fashioned her one perfection. That's why it ended there. Well, Victor, there's no denying it has beauty, but such somberness can only induce mass melancholia. Listen to that. That's all I need. New neighbors with a passion for trash. Is that the sort of thing you want, Monsieur Daudet? Mm, not bad. In fact, just the th- sort of thing I want. Then you're in the wrong studio. Very possibly. Au revoir, Odette. As Monsieur Daudet left Victor's room, the spot where I had been lolling under his window grew suddenly quite uncomfortable. So I followed Dodé across the court because I noticed a bench outside of Shirley's window that would be a much better place for me. To rest, of course. I settled myself just as Dodé knocked on Shirley's door. Come in. May I? My name is Jules Dodé. The producer? Yes, but don't hold it against me. Oh, I should say not. I'm Shirley Sheridan. You are quite as lovely as the tune you were playing. Did you compose it, Miss Sheridan? I'm afraid I'm the guilty party. I'm looking for some songs like that for a new operetta I'm producing. Would you mind playing it again? Well, I'd be happy to. Try to forget, won't you? All you have meant to me. All I have meant to you, too. I know just the spot in the play for that number. I'll fill the stage with dancers in Latin American costumes. As they dance, they'll sing. Try to forget, won't you? All you have meant to me And all I've meant to you too I'm sending back to you The things you said to me Just the spirit that needs to be injected into the score that headstrong young composer has written. Injected? But I couldn't do that, Monsieur Daudet. I know how a composer would feel having someone else alter his score. There goes the happiness boy across the court again. That's the composer whose operetta I'm considering, Victor Florescu. Florescu? Yes, he has loads of talent, but egotistical. 
thinks no one composes anything good but himself. You should have heard what he said about your composition. He, he didn't like it? He called it trash, but no matter. His show will not be produced without lighter music. He'll argue, but Odette is used to calming him. Odette? Yes, the star of the show. And of course, she has a personal interest in him. Very personal. And he has a personal interest in her? Definitely. Although it's apparent he dabbles elsewhere from time to time. Oh, he dabbles, does he? Well, Monsieur Daudet, I'll write as many songs for Victor Florescu's operetta as you can use. I'm something of a dabbler myself. <laughs> Lesser genius than Pompino would have given up hope to see his favorite romance fall so far asunder. I did not know how, but I was sure that someday, somehow, I would bring those two together in happiness in spite of themselves. So, on the night that Shirley was to play her music for Victor at Dode's apartment, I, uh, quite coincidentally, was standing near his window. Enjoying the view of the lovely bois. Oh, Jules, I, I'm so nervous about tonight. But you needn't be, my dear. When Victor hears your songs, well, not even that mad genius could resist your charm. Ah, surely, my dear. If I was sure that no one else had a claim on your heart, I would... Uh, that will be your debt and Victor. You can depend on him for bad timing. Now, don't worry. If Victor won't permit your numbers in the show, there will be no show. Well, hello, Dad. Come in. And, Victor, how are you? Well, where's this composer? Let's get it over with. I promised I'd listen, so... Shirley. Good evening, Victor. Ah, you two know each other? Well, that makes it all the better. Yes, it gets better and better all the time. Now what's the matter with him? Sure, please, no quarreling tonight. Oh, Shirley, this is Mademoiselle Odette, Miss Sheridan. Ah, how do you do, Mademoiselle Sheridan? I'm always interested in Jules' uh, protégés. He's so generous with them. <laughs> I'm sure you speak from experience, mademoiselle. I wish somebody would tell me what's wrong with everybody. Oh, nothing's wrong, Jules, darling. Uh, should I begin my additions to the score? Of course. Sit down, Odette. Victor? I'll stand. Naturally. This is not my own composition, Mr. Florescu, but a rewrite of one of yours. I'm sure it's a great improvement. Oh, I tried to make it a little happier, more optimistic. As I remember, you thought life is wonderful and exciting. I'm glad you found what you were looking for. Florescu, would you mind letting her get on with the thing? All right, Shirley, my dear. Perhaps Mr. Florescu would join me. I'd be... Victor! Charmed. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Florescu. One moment alone, that's all we have known, and yet it seems past. A glimpse of an angel fear Too much for a That's why it ended there One word or two tenderly spoken Give it a love, that little sign Then all our dreams Till you hear the next one. Well, I for one intend to hear no more. Victor's beautiful music ruined. Oh, Dad. I will listen to no more. If you wish to see me, I will be in my apartment. And what do you think, Victor? Unfortunately, Monsieur Daudet, that is also my opinion. Easy commercialized emotion sickens me. Good night. That man should be put away. <laughs> Preferably behind bars, where I won't be able to wring his neck. Victor, Victor. 
Victor, please. Oh, forget Victor, my dear. Frankly, I'm not at all sorry they've left us. Come, my dove. I have a bottle of Napoleon brandy I've been saving for just such an occasion. What does the most beautiful composer in all Paris say to that? What does she say, Jules? Da 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 dee dee, da dee 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 dee. I, I don't quite understand. She wanted to stay, but thought she should go. She wasn't so sure that he'd be good. She wasn't even sure that she'd be good. She wanted to rest, all cuddled and pressed. A popular part of somebody's heart. She loved to be all rapport with him, but not behind a folded door with him. So what did she do? I'll leave it to you. She did just what I'll do, too. Good night, you. Shirley, Shirley, come back, my dove. I'm not a dove. I'm a homing pigeon. Mademoiselle Sheridan. Oh, Pompino. When Pompino decides to watch over someone, he watches. Come, I'll take you on my pigeon. My bicycle is here. Bicycle? A tandem. We, with room for two. Ah, uh, have you never bicycled through the bois in the moonlight? There's always a first time. Let's go. <laughs> uh, Mademoiselle... You are comfortable? Yes, but not very happy. Uh, you and that young composer, you're having trouble, huh? Oh, Pompano, I don't understand it. I fixed his music and did all I could for him. And did he appreciate it? No. He laughed at it and left with Odette. That cat with her fiddle. Ah, 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 ah. You must not jump to conclusions. Perhaps there is a reason, a very simple one. If you will but go to him and give him a chance to explain. Well, I... I... Oh, but of course, if Mademoiselle insists on being stubborn, I... No, 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 Pompey, no, no. Take me to him. Take me as quickly as you can. Nothing matters, nothing matters except his love. Mademoiselle, and there is Victor's door. Go quickly, quickly, up the stairs with you. Victor, Victor, are you there? Victor, Victor, it's Shirley. Please let me in. Uh, uh, what goes on in here? Oh, it is you, Mademoiselle Sheridan. Your studio is on the other side of the court. Madame, has Monsieur Florescu come in yet? Oh, mais oui. In like a storm and then right out again like a hurricane. Bag and baggage. Bag and baggage? He's... he's gone? He says he's through with Paris for life. And if any mail come for him, tear it up. Uh, I go back to bed now. Bonsoir, mademoiselle. Bonsoir, madame. Oh, Victor, Victor, I loved you so. Here's a bit of news which means something to everybody who uses transportation. And in this country, that's all of us. The other day, the Association of American Railroads completed arrangements to build a new railroad research laboratory. It's going to be located on the campus of the Illinois Institute of Technology at Chicago. 
From this laboratory, much of the widespread engineering and mechanical research of the industry will be directed. This new development is completely in line with the long-time practice of the railroad industry. For many years, research has been carried on by and for the railroads in the laboratories of universities and technological institutions and manufacturers of railroad supplies and equipment. Research has been carried on, too, on the railroads, which, in addition, have served as the proving grounds for the testing and trial of ideas, no matter where developed. There are two things we should keep in mind about all railroad research. One is that railroads don't make things to sell. They buy things, all sorts of things, from manufacturers and use them to produce transportation service. As a service industry, therefore, railroads receive the benefits of research done by almost every manufacturing industry in the country. And another thing to remember is that the railroads which serve you can never shut down to retool for next year's models. So everything new that is introduced on a railroad must work right along with what is already there during a necessary period of transition. That's why progress on the railroads is and must be an evolution, a growth, not a revolution. This new research laboratory to be built by the Association of American Railroads on the Illinois Technology Campus is another forward step in a long-continued cooperative program that is going forward today more actively and on a broader front than ever before. You will see its results more and more in the new equipment coming into service on the railroads in ever-increasing numbers, just as one part of what Mr. Kettering called the amazing progress of the railroads. <laughs> The show train will return in just a moment after a brief pause for station identification. Now back to The Cat and the Fiddle, starring Reza Stevens, Adolph Manjou, and yours truly, Gordon MacRae. And here's Pompano continuing the story. For days I searched all Paris, but I could find not one trace of Victor. Then one day, as I was passing Shirley's window, I heard her talking to Dodet. No, Jules, my mind is made up. I'm sailing for America on the first boat I can get, and I won't allow any of my songs to be used in, in Victor's score. You're throwing away your big chance, my dear. I'm sorry, Jules, but that's final. Come in. Mademoiselle. What is it, Pompano? Mademoiselle, you must give up this thought of going to America. Oh, I'm sorry, Pompano, but there's no reason for me to stay Just now. because your composer has vanished. All you have to do is get him back. Well, he'll never come back. Ah, but of course he will. He composed this operetta, no? Yes. And Monsieur Daudet wants to produce it if some of your songs are used, no? Of course I do. Then let it be produced. Pompano, what are you talking about? Mademoiselle, angry lions could not keep a composer away from hearing the opening night of his first operetta. Oh, Pompano... I think you might be right. You're a genius. Naturellement, the greatest genius in all Paris. Shirley, I'll give it the most brilliant opening this town has ever seen. Uh, for once it appeared that Pompino, the greatest student of human nature in all Paris, was wrong. At the opening of the operetta, Shirley and I stood in the lobby, watching every member of the audience. But nowhere did we see Victor. Patiently, we waited all through the show. Oh, Pompano, what a pity Victor can't hear how everyone loves his music. Ah, Mademoiselle is too generous. They like your music, oh, but, too. But listen, they're going to do the finale now, and I didn't touch one note of it. It's all Victor.
Herr Colleen, for you, Mamsel. No, no, it's for Victor. Victor isn't here. Uh, uh, look, look. Monsieur Daudet is out on the stage. Monsieur, Madame, I thank you for the manner in which you have received tonight's operetta. You have called for the author. Actually, there are two of them. But I can only guarantee producing one. I won't go up there. This one is standing in the wings, where he has been standing all evening. Monsieur Victor Flores. Victor! Victor Pomino, did you hear? Thank you. Thank you very much. If, if you enjoyed tonight's production, it was because of my collaborator. For it was she who supplied the happiness that is in it. And if she is in the audience, I beg her to come up here and stand beside me where she belongs. Are you out there, Shirley? Yes, Victor, yes. Here I am. Go on, go on, go up oh, there. Yes, Pompano. Shirley, my darling, are, are you coming? Yes, Victor, yes. Here, my dear. Right up those steps. Oh, thank you, dear. I've lost you, but what hits I'll get out of you and Victor. Shirley, my darling, kiss me. No, 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 in front of, in front of this whole audience? Why, even your Aunt Hester would approve this time. I'm asking you to marry me. Oh, Victor. <laughs> Give us your song. Sing. All right, you two. Save that clinch till later. Sing. The nighttime stars are soft and So we decide, I, Pompino, the greatest romantic genius in all Paris, slipped out of the theater. Mission completed. So very glad to be sitting high and dry. Looking on I was Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This is Gordon McRae giving a special vote of thanks to our guest stars this evening, Miss Reese Stevens and Mr. Adolf Manjou, and to the other members of tonight's cast for their fine performances in our production of The Cat and the Fiddle, which was adapted for radio by Mr. Don Ettlinger. Next week, our star-studded show train will arrive on the same tracks at the same time. On board will be the Metropolitan Opera Soprano, Miss Dorothy Kirsten, and Kenny Baker to join me in bringing you the famous Sigmund Romberg operetta, the Student Prince, with our chorus under the direction of Norman Lubov and the music arranged and conducted by Carmen Dragon. Well, it looks as though we're ready to pull out. So until next week, goodbye. Remember, during the coming week, as always, the American railroads will provide for you the dependable, low-cost transportation which is so essential to the American way of living. The Cat and the Fiddle has been presented by special arrangement with Pam's Whitmark Music Library. Mr. Marshall will soon be seen in the Warner Brothers picture, My Dream is Yours. Gordon McRae appeared on this program by arrangement with Warner Brothers. This is Marvin Miller.